Fire! Damn your bloods, fire! Welcome to Dates and Dead Guys. I am Miles Fisher, and you are starting part one of a two-part series on the Boston Massacre. In part one, we're going to start by providing context for the event that took place on March 5th in 1770, and then hopefully move on to just telling the story as it's written by most historians. In part two, we're going to take a look at the trial of British soldiers that took place after the event and try to piece together some of the evidence to get a better idea of what actually happened. This story in history has a lot of unknowns, and like a lot of other things in history, we really don't know completely what happened. That is really, though, the whole point of this thing. History is complicated. It's not just dates and dead guys. Future President John Adams once wrote of the Boston Massacre, quote, On that night, the formation of American independence was laid. Not the Battle of Lexington or Bunker Hill were more important events in American history than the Battle on King Street on the 5th of March, 1770. End quote. This event, like many around this decade, were pivotal moments in the movement for independence. So let's take a look at what happened. Tension between the American colonies and Britain had been on the rise since Britain started wanting to tax colonists to help pay for the French and Indian War. This itself is a topic worth debate, as the British felt the colonies were the main beneficiaries of the war, and as such should play a role in paying for it. The colonists, however, felt that if they were going to be taxed, they sure as hell should have some representation in the British Parliament. This leads to the well-known cry of no taxation without representation. Regardless, Britain, the mother country, acts like a parent and does whatever the hell they want, in this case, passing taxes. The most notable taxes passed during this time were the Sugar Act of 1764, the Stamp Act of 1765, and later the Townsend Duties in 1767. Each of these laws sucked for the colonists as it forced them to pay more for goods. The Stamp Act gets a lot of attention in history books, but the Sugar Act gives a good example of why the colonies hated these laws so much. They violated their rights. The Sugar Act established what we call Vice Admiralty Courts. These courts set up special rules for people who had been smuggling products. But instead of getting a jury, a judge decides whether or not you're innocent or guilty. Taking away their colonial right to a jury was a violation of English law, and the colonists themselves were in fact English citizens. The Stamp Act required stamps on all legal documents as well as other daily materials. Massive protests ensued as well as boycotts of British goods, and the Act was eventually repealed by the British. The British, recognizing that repealing the taxes because of protests was a sign of weakness, issued the Declaratory Act of 1766. That maintained that the British had, quote, the absolute right of Parliament to bind the colonies in all cases whatsoever, end quote. This policy really backfired on the British. In my estimation, it's kind of like a parent giving in and giving their kid ice cream, and then afterward trying to convince the kid that they're really in charge. If you do that kind of thing consistently as a parent, there's a good chance you're going to lose that kid. They know that you're going to cave, and they're going to give you more hell in the future. Not being a parent, I feel very confident in telling you that you'd always rule with an iron fist. Make your children live in fear. That's probably irresponsible advice. After repealing the Stamp Act, the colonists now have a go-to move when the towns and duties are passed in 1767. It works, and all the taxes associated with the towns and duties are repealed as well, except for the tax on tea, which I'm sure won't cause any problems in the future. Despite these victories, the colonists still viewed these acts by Parliament as tyrannical, and there is some support for that. The British were absolutely taking increasingly aggressive means to control the colonies, especially Boston. By 1770, tension was high in Boston between the locals and the British. Colonists would more than frequently vandalize stores and intimidate merchants who sold British goods as protest to taxes. Colonists were still smuggling tons of goods to avoid taxes. As a result, the British leadership had sent troops to occupy the city. In 1770, there were 2,000 British soldiers occupying the city. But there were only 16,000 people actually living in the city of Boston. That's one soldier for every eight citizens. That seems like a lot. Soldiers were officially there to support laws and aid civil authority. They, in reality, at least from the perspective of the colonists, were there for the purposes of oppression, to show force, maintain control over the legislative and executive powers of the colony, and to crush any thoughts of liberty, which do exist. The numbers support the threatening nature of the troops. What do you need a one-day ratio for if not to show force? Could you imagine if your government felt that one in eight people in your city had to be cops in order to keep it safe? How messed up would that city have to be? Baltimore and Chicago should maybe think about it. And soldiers were not welcome there. There are countless stories of abuse of colonists from British soldiers. One publication had the following examples. Soldiers would fire muskets at citizens, prick them with bayonets, assault the magistrate, 
And one thing that would drive anyone nuts is that the citizens felt the soldiers were breaking laws and not being held to the same standard as the citizens. Not surprisingly, squabbles, or as they're often called, a phrase would occur, and growing into the 1770s, these are coming increasingly frequent. Just the month before, in February, there was an incident in which an 11-year-old boy was shot by a British customs officer while he was trying to break up a crowd while things were being thrown at him. Now fast forward to March 5th, to our unhappy affair, as it is called by several publications, and let's get serious for a second. It's 9.30 p.m., there was a layer of ice in the ground, a slight fall of snow during the day, and a young moon in the evening. Three men lie dead on King Street outside the British Customs House, all shot by British soldiers. More are injured. Two will die within a few days. British soldiers are reloading their guns. The crowd tries to clear the dead and injured as they make sense of what happened. British Captain Thomas Preston asks his men why they fired. They look confused. One of them replies, you ordered us to. That's our scene in Boston directly following the shooting, but events like this are typically escalations. They don't come out of nowhere. So let's rewind and take a look at what really happened in the chain of events. Night is falling in Boston on March 5th. With tension high in the city, soldiers were on high alert and the citizens of Boston were extra combatant with them. A crowd of colonists forms near the Brattle Street Church because of mutual harassment between citizens and soldiers. The bantering back and forth turns into a fight. Bells, meant to signal fire in the city, pull people out of their homes and into the streets. There was no fire. The bells were rung for the purpose of getting people to enter the streets in order to face down the British soldiers. At the same time the crowd is gathering outside the Brattle Street Church, a young soldier named Hugh White, a sentry stationed outside the British Customs House, gets into an argument with a citizen, a barber, over one of his offers failing to pay for a haircut. White hits him with the butt of his musket before he moves along bloodied from the incident. At first, since most of the action is taking place outside of the church, this might seem like a throwaway incident, but karma may be a thing. The soldiers near the church were ordered to retreat into the barracks. As the crowd was throwing snowballs at them, the captain felt it would be wise to remove the soldiers in order to prevent an incident. With the soldiers gone, the crowd begins to disperse, but tons of citizens are still in the streets, and the bells bring more. It's 9.15 p.m., Hugh White, who basically just pistol-whipped one of the people, is standing outside the customs house protecting the king's money. Like a cuck. Having no soldiers to yell at, because they all went inside, people who remained in the streets, including the barber who was hit with the musket, start to gather outside the customs house. They want revenge. When they begin threatening him, White loads his gun. It should be brought up here that the sources say that this is when he loaded his gun. His gun was probably actually already loaded. He was probably just priming his gun so that he'd be able to fire, because loading a musket with a crowd near you would be a bit of a to-do. The crowd then became increasingly aggressive and started throwing things at him. And before you feel bad for Hugh White in this scenario, please remember he did just melee a colonist. We gave examples before about the actions of British soldiers, and you do get the sense through the writings that they act as if they are above the law. Meanwhile, Captain Preston, a British officer and maybe the largest point of controversy in our story, gets word that because of the bells, citizens are in the streets. They have gathered outside the customs house, and one of their soldiers, White, is currently under attack. In Preston's statement, published a few months following the incident, he says, quote, I was soon informed by a townsman, and their intention was to carry off the soldier from his post and probably murder him, end quote. Preston, thinking that sounded a little bit extreme, asked the guy to gather what he called further intelligence, and the guy does return to him and tells him that they do in fact intend to murder White. Preston was like, well shit, they're gonna kill Hugh White. Who will guard the king's money? Best go intervene. Preston sends seven men to the customs house. They rush through the crowd, poking people with bayonets as they go, and form a semicircle around White in the sentry box of the customs house, which I assume is where the sentry hangs out. White joins the formation, and an order is given for the men to prime their muskets. Preston rushed through the crowd and joined his men, but at this point there is a large crowd that greatly outnumbers the troops. The size of the crowd is debatable. Most of the testimony will put it between 30 and 100 people, which is a pretty big gap, but most historians today kind of go in the middle ground and assume they were somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 to 60 people. Both sides are not being nice to each other, hurling insults and fainting aggression. The crowd grows emboldened. They don't have guns, but they do have clubs. They are whistling, yelling, throwing snowballs, and maybe other items. They are daring the soldiers to fire. Preston tries to calm the crowd. 
A soldier to the right of the formation has his gun hit with a club. He falls to the ground, and as he collects himself, he gets to his feet and hears fire. Damn your bloods, fire. The first shot rings out, striking a colonist in the chest, and he falls to the ground. Moments later, two more shots. Then four more. People scream. One colonist is hit in the chest, another in the back, and a third, hit in the head, is missing a large piece of his skull. Others are injured. It's 9.30 p.m. Only 15 minutes have passed. The crowd panics and retreats. The soldiers try to figure out what just happened. They see the bodies. They know the gravity of what they've done. Were we justified? Didn't the captain order us to fire? Before they can sort out what's happening, the crowd begins to reform. They are back to express their anger and to clear the icy road of the dead and injured. The soldiers take a more aggressive posture. They have reloaded and threaten to fire again if the crowd doesn't disperse. Preston orders the troops to withdraw back to the main guardhouse. Immediately with the soldiers gone, word spreads throughout the city that the troops have risen against the people. And before 10 p.m., the people have started collecting their rifles and gathering to take on the British conducting violence in their city. People run to Thomas Hutchinson's house. He's a lieutenant governor. They inform him that there is a mess in the city and he has to intervene before violence gets worse. He goes, and in Dock Square, people have gathered to take on the British. They are wielding clubs, swords, and calling for guns. The lieutenant governor himself has to retreat into a nearby house because his calls for peace are not answered positively. He goes to King Street, where he meets with Captain Preston. There's an interesting exchange between the two, where the lieutenant governor expresses that the soldiers had no right to fire on the people, and Preston says something to the effect of being obligated to in order to save the century. An angry crowd compels the lieutenant governor to order an inquiry immediately, and Preston and the other troops are arrested. This action pacifies the crowd to a degree, and they slowly start to go home. It is 3 a.m. before things are wrapped up for the night. In part two, we'll take a look at the evidence, the trial, and try to make sense of what happened. Thanks for watching.